see that in fact. So my name is Dale Nordenberg, and I'm the uh, co-founder and uh, executive director for the Medical Device Innovation Safety and Security Consortium, <clears throat> which was started about two years ago. And it was started based on concerns from healthcare delivery organizations with respect to medical devices and their vulnerabilities from a security perspective and the possible uh, adverse events that might be associated with sec these security vulnerabilities. It was established to, through concerns by the healthcare delivery organizations, and we have subsequently in the last two years recruited um, a, a large number of healthcare organizations, and at the same time have broadened the public-private partnership, which is the model for uh, MDIS, to include manufacturers, uh, other technology companies, infrastructure companies, FML or companies, and we work closely with government agencies such as the FDA, uh, HHS, uh, NIST, and, and, and others. We, we have actually three panels during this, this M Health event. Actually, last year we had, we had four panels. Uh, we, we like this venue. We're happy to be back here. And we feel as a group that uh, the issue of medical device security and safety is, uh, is really critical. So today we have a number of folks. We had a slight adjustment in our panel uh, from a participation perspective. Um, but we have uh, Alan Hobbs from Kaiser and Steve Abrahamson from GE, Lynette Sherrill from the VA, Mike Amadi from World Tech, and Julian Goldman from uh, Partners Health. And we have Brian Miller, who is a, uh, an audience-based participant from Intuitive uh, Surgical. So we would like this to be very uh, interactive. So please raise your hands at any moment, and whoever is speaking will, uh, will, will call on you to, uh, to receive your input. And, um, I think with that, let's start. I will, I will try to moderate and keep, keep a, theme, a theme going. And, and this particular panel is about uh, procurement. And the notion, uh, is there someone in the room that could adjust the sound a little bit? And, and, the notion of, and the notion is that procurement offers an opportunity for the stakeholders, broadly speaking, the people, the institutions that are buying medical devices and the institutions that are manufacturing them or the institutions that are building components or infrastructure or related products and services to come together and really define in real time and in a real market the requirements and the attributes that would enable a collective effort to raise the safety profile of medical device industry and the medical device, uh, if you will, medical devices in the healthcare, the healthcare environment. So really what we're talking about is leveraging procurement from a public health perspective. In fact, MDIS is about public health. It's about bringing people together. It's recognizing every stakeholder has a role, a role to play. So really this is public health driven by procurement. And what we're going to discuss today is the, are the various viewpoints of the panelists. And, um, and I think with that, we can, we can start. It looks like Julian has teed up his uh, – you have a couple slides? Yeah, I just made it – it's easier to have a few pictures up. Okay. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, – Dr. Julian Goldman, who uh, actually is, uh, is really one of the pioneers around the whole notion of procurement. And – has been helping to progress this notion of uh, collaboratively dri driven requirements for procurement and medical devices, broadly speaking, driven by interoperability with MD Fire. And with that, I'll let Julian kick it off, and we'll kind of march down the line. Thank you, Dale. I just I put together a few slides because I thought it would be a bit easier to look at the pictures. Uh, sometimes it is than than describing uh, too much. Uh, sure. Uh, right. A uh, little introduction. So my name is Julian Goldman. I'm a physician at Mass General Hospital and medical director of biomedical engineering for Partners Healthcare. Since 2004, we have had a research program on medical device interoperability, addressing some of the needs and gaps, identifying possible solution pathways, including standards, technology, and, and so forth and so on. And I'm sure many of you know, if not everyone here knows, 
that uh, the absence of medical device interoperability has been a longstanding problem in the improvement of the quality of health care and reducing the cost of health care delivery. Historically, we've thought about this in the context of high acuity health care in hospitals and so forth, and certainly over the last few years, and as a diffusion of high acuity care has moved into the home and other environments, we recognize that interoperability gaps in those places are, are just as significant a problem. So what to do about a problem like that? Well, you know, in a sense, historically in the marketplace, we, we vote with our wallets, we vote with our pocketbooks, so to speak. And uh, if a manufacturer introduces a capability, we may buy that capability. But certain capabilities are ecosystem-related capabilities. You can't provide that capability with a single device. So for example, when we started seeing USB or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth in the marketplace, we would never have really bought that capability if we would, or could only buy a Bluetooth earpiece, but there, if there were no phones that supported Bluetooth. Wi-Fi, we wouldn't have bought Wi-Fi capability in computers if there were no hotspots or if we couldn't buy Wi-Fi capability for our own homes. And so certain capabilities require an ecosystem to enable the, the market um, uptake for those things. And interoperability has been one of those challenges. You can't, by definition, have interoperability if you only have one product. You have to have something to be interoperable with. So when struggling with that over the years, we, we really weren't sure what we can do to improve uh, market uptake and to make it clearer uh, to the to industry what the need was. And so in that context, as part of promoting, developing, and advancing interoperability, we, with collaborators, especially from Kaiser Permanente, who had thought about this before, just as we were forming our, our group in 2004, Kaiser stepped forward and said, you know, we, we've been putting some interoperability language in our procurement uh, contracts, and that was really the seed of the idea. So that, so then what could we do if we start to, to promote the discussion about procurement? And I'll show you specifically in the slides. Uh, interesting. Okay. The decipher the controls. So MD Fire is a document that came about after about uh, two years of work with Kaiser Permanente, Partners Healthcare, and Johns Hopkins Medicine under the umbrella of our research program at CIMIT, the Center for Integration of Medicine and Innovative Technology in Cambridge. We needed a neutral convening environment, much as MDIS is a neutral environment to allow for the promotion, adoption, analysis of, of technologies and solutions for security. And this is what we've been doing for interoperability. So we got together with a few few different groups from the different hospitals. And it's a group that, you know, the kind of people you normally have sitting down together at the same table. Biomedical engineering, IS, clinicians, attorneys, and the procurement experts. In other words, people that probably never met each other before in every institution. But they did come together, and we did develop a document which was uh, signed by the different hospitals to, to serve to promote the idea. And recently, in August of this, of this year, uh, the VA uh, signed on um, as well. So what does it look like? So first of all, one of the questions I always get is, how do you find this document? Where is it? And, and so forth. And what does this look like? And I, th I uh, actually went out of sequence. I'm sorry. Uh, so if you go to our website, which is mdpnp.org, medicaldeviceplugandplay.org, or Michael David Paul Nancy Paul.org, mdpnp.org, and you click on the thing that says projects, as you can see, there's MD Fire, the fourth one down. And if you click on that, <coughs> there's a little delay here, sorry. Um, if you click on that, you get this page, which describes MD Fire, talks about its development and in 2008, and it's, um, it has a link for you to download the document itself, which is a, a document, a PDF, and here's what it looks like. And, and the reason, so I brought this up just to make it really easy to find, so to reduce those questions, but I just want you to look at what it says. The document has five sections, an overview, background and clinical context, in other words, a rationale for why these things are important, sample RFI and RFP language, and a table of standards, 
And this is all meant to just be a sample of how to introduce these ideas into the procurement process. It's not meant to be taken and dropped in as a single document. So this is the, the idea behind MD Fire. The idea is twofold. And, and again, I'm going to point you to this paragraph, the last paragraph. MD Fire has two synergistic goals. The first is to promote awareness. So in this case, awareness of the, of the importance of medical device interoperability uh, on the impact of healthcare delivery. And the second is to make it easier to include that language. So part of it is to send a message to industry that this is what we want to buy, so please create it. And the second is here's how we can put the language in the contracts. So I don't plan to show any more details. Those are the only slides I have. And I just wanted to set that and make it very clear as to what this is. So our research program has been working very closely with MDIS. Uh, Dale and I have had many, many hours of meetings and conversation and uh, in order to better coordinate our efforts. Because since, uh, since MD Fire is, a, is a, a document that's already been vetted fairly extensively and is being adopted by a number of healthcare delivery organizations with the intent of supporting additional requirements, it, it, it could be a useful vehicle to start to include security-related requirements. And so that's our plan. And uh, the way the document continues to improve is by feedback from various stakeholders as they assess and ask questions and uh, so forth. As a result of the VA analysis, we, the document doubled in size. I, I would like for that not to keep happening. <laughs> uh, until we have IP, un, until we have a means to store that much data uh, on the internet. So I, I think that, that probably covers everything I should cover, and I'll answer questions. So this is yours. One caveat is that until medical devices started to uh, become network enabled, the whole notion of a document around procurement and interoperability wasn't really necessary. And once people realized that once you have medical devices that are now network enabled and you're making them interoperable, interoperable now security is Going forward, as Julian said, we're very interested in figuring out how to accelerate the capability of uh, health delivery organizations to uh, identify requirements with the market level void. And this has gone out and tried to collect enough health delivery organizations. It feels like we've done a pretty good job at that. Um, and to help focus uh, and have a market level voice, which will help manufacturers you know, better appreciate what, what folks are thinking and vice versa. So, uh, Mike, if you can come up and introduce yourself briefly and then maybe help provide some context into um, those three things that we need to be working to develop in the context of requirements and, uh, and auditing and work. Okay. Uh, I'm Mike Amati, and uh, I've been working with Dale and MDIS really for about a year now. And um, I'm with a company called uh, WorldTech. And uh, we specialize in uh, security testing and have done so for uh, uh, multiple industries for several years. And one of the things that, uh, how Dale and I got involved is we uh, started a conversation. Actually, it was him and uh, uh, Jing Wang at the time, who was with Kaiser at the time. And um, she had mentioned that she had noticed that the medical devices were very similar uh, Security had similar security requirements to control systems, industrial control systems. Anyone here familiar with industrial control systems? Great. So, uh, critical infrastructure components, since uh, the uh, things that run uh, critical systems, be they uh, uh, chemical plants or processes, um, anything which is a a critical system. How many of you would agree that the human body is a very critical system? <laughs> so. Uh, when you're looking at these devices, you're really looking at something which is a control system. And as a matter of fact, Jay Radcliffe, who uh, uh, demonstrated a, uh, a hack um, uh, a year ago, called his uh, hacking the human SCADA system. SCADA is a type of control system. So uh, what's interesting is when we were looking at this, I said, you know, we actually have some uh, security requirements, testing requirements, and uh, some sort of procurement language that we put in place for the control system space uh, in multiple areas through the Department of Homeland Security, DHS procurement language, uh, through the WIB in Europe, and of course the, uh, the soon-to-be IEC standard, IEC 62443-2-4. Uh, 
there will not be a test on this, but <laughs> 6443-2-4, I'd like to show it to you. Well, when I showed it to them, they said, wow, this is great. And I said, you know, ideally when you're looking to come up with procurement language or if you develop procurement language, you should map it to what's currently in existence today. And there's, there's a lot of good reasons for that. One is that when you're looking at a company, let's say GE, for example, or companies like Siemens that make both control systems and medical devices, okay, and have to build it, it's actually not a bad idea if they're actually using one set of security requirements for multiple devices, right? Because obviously you don't want to do work twice if you can avoid it. So when they looked at this, they said, wow, we can use these requirements. I said, great. So there's three things you really need to have in place. One is you have to have some sort of set of controls for um, auditing against. So if you're, if you're a device manufacturer, a device manufacturer should look at a set of controls and say, okay, these are the things that I need to have in place. Based upon that, you have to have some sort of a procurement language that you can provide a auditor saying, based upon uh, what, we, what we expect to you and based upon these controls, this is what we expect from you when we procure these devices from you. And by the way, some people may think it's, it's, it could be the exact thing. It, it can't. Procurement language is different than a set of, of auditing controls. And the third thing you need to have in place, and this is the important part, is a auditing program. So you, you have to have the controls, the language, but then you have to have some sort of a way to audit against whatever those requirements are. So what we're working on right now is coming up with what are the controls going to be, what's the procurement language going to be, and then of course the other part that's still you know, not fully in place yet, or really not at all, is what are the auditing requirements going to be? Because I was talking to Lynette earlier and she said, hey, if you put a firewall on something, that's actually wonderful, right? But who's actually checking the firewall logs? How are you actually make, checking to make sure, auditing to make sure that what you put in place is actually working? So the auditing portion, the testing portion of it is actually very important. And I see Jeff Walker here is from Codenomicon, so he understands fully what I'm saying. You actually have to test to make sure that this stuff is in place and works. one of the things that we are, we are working on right now. And just moving on down the line, we have an opportunity here from the perspective of one of the uh, largest healthcare delivery, maybe the largest healthcare delivery organization in the country, uh, the VA. So uh, Lynette Sherrill is the Deputy Director for Security uh, nationally for the VA, Medical Devices. She will explain her exact title in just a moment. He, he gets it wrong every time. It's been two and a half years, so there's no hope it's going to get right. I'm actually not the head of all. Exactly. But I'm actually not, especially if today since my boss is here, I definitely don't want to lay claim to being in charge of all security for the VA. That is his job, and he's in the front row if you want to talk about that. Um, anyway, so as Dale's talking about with um, – with, and Julie mentioned interoperability, procurement language. Procurement lang language is not new to any of us. Um, we've had procurement language for a long time to address all kinds of things. And with the federal government, obviously, we have more than our share, which is probably why Julian's document is now 20% you know, heavier than it was before he sent it to the VA. So um, we, the, the difference we want to, we've made in medical devices with procurement is we have language specific to medical devices. Um, our first attempt at this was several years ago, 
And we were really just looking for more information because we didn't know. You know, it was more like, you know, a medical device would show up and we'd put it on the network and we were just surprised at what would happen when it would work. So, you know, you didn't really know ports and protocols and, and you know, really any statistical details. So we started asking for that information up front. Um, what we... What we quickly learned is um, we need more information to, act, to really do a really good setup to understand the risk that we're bringing into the environment. Um, we need to know more about that. So right now we're in the process of working with MDIS, um, partnering with um, some very smart people, and we were putting, pulling together uh, a cost-based analysis, or so it's a risk analysis, and then we will assign cost. And we, we hope to have this developed over the next year, definitely, and start implementing it, where we will do comparisons in procurement based on, um, we're looking at this set of security criteria, and let's say firewalls. Let's say we determine that we really need a firewall in front of a particular medical device. Um, if two of, the, two of the people that we can buy it from don't have firewalls and one does, well, we'll add that cost basis to that procurement so that we can level that playing field. Because just because the vendor doesn't have the control, the, the healthcare delivery organization is still responsible for trying to mitigate that risk in some way. So there is a cost to that medical device not having that control in place when we purchase it and that's something we have to start to account for. And, and that is really going to be the basis for trying to go move forward with procurement. And I know I'm not explaining that. Well, I did so much better at lunch explaining that. So if you guys have questions, I'm happy to try to help explain it a little further. But mm -hmm. Well, and the, and the key point that Dale's bringing up, I think, is that we're paying for it already um, because we are having to implement those mitigating controls when they don't come built into the device. So it's, it, the cost is already there. It's sort of recognizing the cost and applying it at the procurement, at the time of procurement, so that we get the best product with, um, for our money that, that's being spent on the product. So... That really, we're really excited about this, and I have to say, it was, this was not my idea, but it really was a collective idea. It came out of the membership, the healthcare delivery organizations within the consortium, and we are all going to be working together to provide those cost factors that go along with the controls that we'll be looking at with those devices. So we're very excited about this, and very excited about moving forward with it. Thanks.
not going to get any of us anywhere. Right? So what we're trying to do is as efficiently as possible harmonize uh, requirements with feasibility and, and you know, practical approaches so that we can together raise the time to raise the level of expertise and <coughs> raise the, uh, the safety profile of the medical device uh, industry. All right. Thanks, Dale. As Dale said, I am Steve Abrahamson. I am the program manager for product security at GE Healthcare. And I'm here from the GE Healthcare offices in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for, for coming here today and staying kind of late. I know it's kind of at that time where some of you may have thought about maybe it's time to go to happy hour or maybe go out for dinner. But if you're really serious about security, that has to be pushed aside. You have to forego happy hour. <laughs> You cannot be happy in this in this field. Uh, and I, I've suggested that if there's a meeting after three, that there should be an open bar at the session, and we'd have even better attendance. But I do want to thank you for coming. Uh, the, the kind of message that we're talking about today, part of my job is to deliver that message to the company that I work for, GE Healthcare. GE Healthcare, as you can imagine, is a vast bureaucracy. Uh, one of the roles that I have is to work with about 40 different engineering organizations across the U.S. and indeed across the globe on trying to elevate the level of product security that we have in our, in our products. Uh, and I'm in a unique position also where I, uh, my job resi resides in our science and technology organization. Uh, I'm an engineer by background and I'm in a unique position where I get to work a lot with commercial teams as well as directly with a lot of our key customers. And then I have to translate what they're looking for back into our engineering organizations. So I'm kind of straddling the fence between talking to salespeople, talking to engineers, uh, talking directly to customers. Uh, so I get a, a unique perspective. Uh, and I try to, to fill the gap. Sometimes it's dangerous to have an engineer talking directly to a customer because engineers are very digital and they always know what is right. Uh, and it's hard to convince them the, of, of something different. So there's always a challenge in trying to bridge the gap between very technical engineering discussion and what is really motivating our customers. So I'm in that unique position. Uh, now, one thing I can tell you uh, when it comes to procurement of medical devices as it pertains to security and its cousin privacy is the new environment is that if we don't address security, we're not going to sell product. Uh, since I've been in this role for a couple of years now, I have been uh, promoting the idea within GE Healthcare that adding security to our products and addressing it in a much more consistent way is going to help us sell products in the marketplaces and, and is going to add value. Uh, we're finally at a tipping point, I believe, where it's starting to get much more emphasis and much greater level of, of recognition, which is a double-edged sword. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it was very hard for me to get a high level of attention on how we can improve the level of security in our products. We had a lot of people working on it. It was not necessarily done in a, in a highly organized way. And we're trying to uh, get a lot of attention on doing it in a, in a much better, more consistent way across all of our different product lines. Now uh, I'm reviewing what, what I'm doing with vice presidents, and they're asking me why we can't do this next week and that sort of thing. So it's, it's gone from not getting a lot of attention to getting a lot of high level of attention in the company. Uh, we traditionally are very good at looking at user requirements from the healthcare practitioner side, the medical functionality. Uh, our regulators are predominantly concerned with medical functionality and safety. We're not so good looking at security uh, traditionally out in the marketplace. Uh, but when we deliver a product, it really has two owners. One owner is the medical practitioner who is looking at that medical functionality, including its interoperability, its ability to uh, you know, make data accessible, ability to care for the patient. The second owner is the IT department. The IT department looks at it and says, hey, this thing may have security vulnerabilities. It may not uh, meet the different types of security requirements that we have. Uh, and they start to take ownership of it as well once it's in the user environment. What we're seeing is that the people that are concerned with, secu with security are getting a much more uh, important role in the procurement process. We have customers like the VA, for example, that go through a pre-procurement process where they want to assess the security features of a device before they procure it. Uh, we have other customers that are currently engaging with us on uh, special contract addendums that address security specifically. And they're looking at it holistically. 
uh, we can't look at security just in the mode of what is inherent in the medical device. When customers look at security, uh, many of you I know are familiar with this, they're looking at the whole operation. So it's not only the medical device and how it protects data, transmits data, but they're looking at service operations. And uh, if, we're, if we're managing any systems, uh, they're looking at lifecycle support. They're looking at a whole host of things that pertain to security. And when we look at security, security is all about risk management. Uh, as I mentioned, my job title is Program Manager for Product Security. Uh, I always emphasize that product security is not security. The customers have to provide the security within their user environment. What we can do is we can provide products that better enable our customers to protect information and protect the safety of their patients. Uh, and, and that's how we, we want to work very closely with our customers in order to more effectively do that. Uh, something else that's uh, becoming real interesting, something that, that Mike talked about when, uh, when he was speaking a few minutes ago, is the concept of the industrial internet and its application within healthcare. We really have a healthcare internet, and that is really the application and combination of intelligent machines, which we certainly have in the healthcare industry, uh, with what we now call big data analytics. Uh, that's the new term uh, these days, big data. You gotta have big data. Uh, so we certainly have big data, uh, lots of data is available in the medical environment. And it's data not only on patient care and patient data, but it's data on device operability. You know, how is that device functioning? Uh, what are the operating parameters? What are they doing over time? Is the device running properly? Is it performing the right level of, of care? So it's patient data as well as technical machine data. And then it's people within a user environment. So these, those three things together form what we call an industrial internet and its application within the healthcare environment. Uh, so that's a, a growing trend in the industry as well. Uh, so those are some highlights. Uh, we certainly can get into any of those areas in more detail when we get into some Q&A. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it back over to Dale. So before you sit down, and we can yeah. ask Ellen to jump up from, from time to time to talk a little bit about standards. What, you know, you've participated in a lot of discussions uh, around, um, around the notion of procurement, procurement requirements. We've talked about standards. We've talked about FDA regulation guidelines. From a manufacturer perspective, how does this notion of requirements to drive change versus, or procurement to drive change versus waiting for <coughs> standards to emerge in three to five years or waiting for the FDA to regulate us in the same amount of time? Does it make sense? Does it feel like it's rushed? Do you, how do you feel? Yeah, I think we definitely need to evolve to a standards-based approach. Uh, we are currently in the mode where security uh, is totally market-driven. Uh, we, like I mentioned, we want to enable security on the part of our customers. Uh, but I can tell you that we don't have regulators coming to us asking us if our medical devices meet HIPAA requirements. It's, it's the regulations as they exist do not apply to the medical device manufacturers, uh, but they do apply to the healthcare providers. And we, you know, we accept our role in that uh, in that process. But it's all about better enabling our customers to manage their risks. Now, I mentioned that we see a lot of different things coming from different customers. The larger, more sophisticated customers have a very good understanding of a comprehensive look at security. Smaller customers are just getting into it, and they look at things from a much more simplified fashion. But if we can take an approach that's much more standards-based over time, that's going to allow a much more effective response on the part of the medical device manufacturers, uh, and it's going to be much more efficient because uh, what, uh, what we're forced to do now is respond uh, to customers on a one-off situation, but what we're planning to do uh, within GE, and uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if this is mirrored in other manufacturers as well, is looking across that landscape and integrating that into internal standards that we can apply to risk management processes as well as uh, design processes and customer support processes. Those standards really should become eventually industry standards that are applicable to everybody because one thing I always like to emphasize, my, my previous uh, role at GE, or I should say about 10 years ago, I used to work at GE Aviation. We make jet aircraft engines. In the aviation industry, we don't want to compete on safety. Uh, anything that GE would discover related to safety, we would share it with our competitors, Pratt & Whitney, Rolls-Royce, other competitors. Uh, the same thing should be true in medical device safety and security. If you have an insecure environment, that's really not good for anybody, so we need to do what is best for the industry and not really compete uh, on that basis. Uh, obviously, at GE, we want to do things better than anybody else, but we'll, really when it comes down to patient safety, 
uh, and, and privacy, we want it to be a safe and, and secure environment. So standards, I think, are going to enable us to do that more effectively across the industry. Yeah, I mean, so industry-driven standards is really the way, it, 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 the, the, usually what works best anyways. If you look at the, uh, you know, like I said, the Web Consortium, which created the, what's now becoming the IEC standards, that was a group of, uh, of end users, literally provider, the, the equivalent of provider organizations coming together and saying, hey, look, this is what we have to deal with and this is what we want our vendors to provide us. And if you actually look at the way, as very familiar, the way IETF got created, you know, in the, uh, you know, internet standards and you know, wireless standards. I mean, that's that was a completely industry driven, and you know, honestly, I mean, industry really understands what its requirements are better than anyone else. So, the nice thing about having industry driven standards is, by the time it actually becomes a quote unquote official standard, which in many cases have the uh, um, force of law behind them, they're already doing it. When you say industry, you're referring to internal standards, like you said, internally driven standards. Well, actually, it, it, so it's, ideally it should be both. Now, in this case, I, you know, I believe that the, uh, the procurement standards should be, you know, driven by the organizations that are procuring. But one great thing about MDIS is you're working with the uh, hardware manufacturers themselves so that when you're done, you're not just springing something on them, but you've actually had conversations and said, hey, you know, this is what we want you to do. Can you do this? <coughs> right? And then you actually end up with something that's usable at the end. So um, we're going to have Alan step up. And while he's doing that, the uh, epidemiologist in me is going to do a quick survey and answer that question. Um, Mike Schrift, our technologies. Um, any thoughts given to standardizing failure like this to banks and the uh, um, manufacturing industry and uh, um, the uh, information yeah. industry and everybody else has tried to uh, standardize? So I, I, just a, so quick thoughts about that. So aligning, you know, so the risk you're talking about is that we all align around a solution that is inherently problematic and we standardize on that. And in the abstract, that is risky. Uh, one could argue that when you balance, when you have to balance risks, you compare what we do today, which is the Wild West. Uh, with vulnerabilities everywhere and inability of the community to identify these failure points in common uh, collaboratively so that we could then address them. It, it, in, in a sense, uh, philosophically, you can compare this to the open software movement and the strength in the specifically in security of, ex of uh, sharing security-related algorithms globally to look f to better understand their vulnerabilities and then to address them globally um, compared to, for example, security through obscurity. So I think uh, philosophically there's a, there's a part of your argument that fits in that kind of space. Uh, but I think the other part you're hitting at, which is really interesting and very challenging, is the idea that we are talking about a system, a very complex system. You could argue uh, there are multiple systems involved. 
and understanding the, the implications of, of the complexity of a system and its vulnerabilities is really one of the challenges. And I can tell you that certainly within the scope of the work that we've been doing on interoperability, uh, the, the historical failure of solutions in interoperability in healthcare have been because they have ignored the, the totality of the system. They've been point-to-point -point solutions. And when brought together in the complexities of a healthcare environment, they, they are unable to be scaled uh, and they have many, many other problems. So I think you're, you're hitting on the, the system aspect, which is a really, really critical point. Um, I'll just uh, I'll just real quickly state that it's certainly evolved. Um, certainly now, what uh, what our biomedical engineering staff knows is that when they are going to purchase a medical device that's going to be placed on the network, they can't do that in a vacuum, and they have to bring their CIO to the table, their information security officer, oftentimes the privacy officer. There's a lot. There's an entire team of people now, and I think we've heard this over and over again. Five years ago, probably not so much. It was probably more um, clinician-driven. And not that that's not still the predominant, you know, requirement. Is obviously you want to get a product that is going to service the clinician's needs and, and the needs of the patient. But at the same time, there's now a team of both IT and biomedical engineering staffs that have to come together to really figure out how do we implement this, especially with IEHRs. I mean, when you throw IEHRs into this and that these devices need to be interoperable and you bring in that standard as well, you really can't. Procurement's changed, I think, 100% since in the past well, five years. Um, a quick question. What, what is your opinion? Is it better to leave if you will, the standard as it is?
Dale, yeah, and I think I would, just to kind of add to the, those points, what's changed at, for us at Partners Healthcare is that our requirements have not changed significantly. The sophistication of the application of those requirements have changed. That basically, at, we simply didn't allow many medical devices onto the network if they were wireless. So clinicians tried to purchase devices and we wouldn't permit them five years ago. It's the vendors who have now stood up and are meeting our security requirements uh, for wireless. For the most part, that's the biggest shift. So the, uh, I wanted to bring up a point. So you, you bring up a very important point, you know, standardiz standardization failures or a failure that results through standardization. And that, that actually does happen. But what I, what, the way that usually happens is when the regulatory space, and especially like, you know, quote, unquote, you know, Congress, for example, gets involved without the industry's input. So what's happening here is you have the industry members that are actually working together and saying, hey, what are we going to do to actually make this better and more secure? A perfect example is something that became, quote, unquote, standardized in the U.S. that is a dismal failure for security is the Transportation Safety Administration. We were reacting to something that we saw happen that was, you know, oh, my God, this is terrible. And all of a sudden we have what we have to deal with today in, in the TSA. It's complete failure. And when I had a discussion with the GAO, when you're familiar with the GAO report that came out, I'm sure, I said to them, look, be very wary of Congress passing any legislation about security until the industry has had time to have a, have, uh, a discussion and work together to what is going to work for the industry. And that way you can avoid these failures. It should come from the industry and not from the legislation. That's where the standardization usually fails. Well, yeah, first of all, my name is Alan Hobbs. I'm a health IT strategy. I'm in the health IT strategy and policy department, Kaiser Permanente. I'm an analyst. I'm a co-chair with HL7 and also a project lead on the um, responsibility agreement 8001. Before I, before I really want to answer Dale's question on procurement, and I think uh, Julian mentioned a while ago that um, you know, when we were begin working with MD Fire, we, this came, these issues came about in converging networks and beginning to look at exactly how we uh, began to organize ourselves in terms of looking at the manufacturers and looking at the IT networks and concomitantly, which actually brings us to this issue on, on, um, on the responsibility agreements. Uh, the second thought on the failure, we do not have really a, um, good simulation of models of how to fail most successfully. So what do I mean by that? Um, particularly within the healthcare industry, critical infrastructure, we're one of 18, um, and what we have are interdependencies on energy, transportation, and so forth. So one way we could do begin to look at this is how do we mitigate against cascade failure in a cyber event or an unintended event to mitigate against the problems that, that occur that impacts resiliency and sustainability over time. So modeling for cascade failure, a number of groups can do that. The, uh, the um, Sandia National Lab has its capabilities, other labs across the country. So a little bit about um, turning now to uh, 8001. <coughs> to be pretty much brief so we can get some more interaction here. Um, as you know, uh, we had the uh, ISO and IEC uh, joint working group was developed uh, for 8001 for risk management. We've had a number of different technical reports. More recently in Vienna, we began to looking at responsibility agreements. And why is that just so important to this discussion, particularly around procurement? If you look at the HDOs and what we've done in networking, it's been primarily about in hospitals. But now as you move toward this convergence, what is it going to take to really have that end-to-end -end capability, that end-to-end -end, uh, lifespan? And it really depends on the manufacturers. It depends on their network. and depends on the HDOs working concomitantly. And it's that junction of those three areas that need to occur in a responsibility agreement. 
So, um, as I said, we met uh, here in Vienna, Australia. Yeah, the shared responsibility or responsibility agreements comes from looking at the roles and the capabilities and among all the different stakeholders. And it, with respect to the manufacturers, we actually need to understand what that role and responsibility is, what is the accountability, what is the service model. And if you move to the IT network folks, you need to have them at the same time. At the same time. And so to be able to move this toward a lifespan of risk, you need to integrate all three of those together. So let me just tell you what we found without going into the document. I, um, uh, we uh, submitted it on the 9th of November. Uh, it's in looking, it's being uh, reviewed through the February uh, 15th of 2013. And so here are our just basically takeaways, that's which I wanted to give you. So what we're wanting to do, and this is basically a draft of guidance. This is not the contractual arrangement. We left that piece out right now because of the legal issues with respect to various medical entities designed to really hone down in terms of those contractual arrangements, specific in context to those, to those environments and venues. What we were offering is pretty much a guideline, so here they are. Ensure timely and useful information exchange between stakeholders prior to going live and implementing. So this is an important piece. You want to get the manufacturers at the, at the table, the network people at the table, the clinicians, and have all those components. And when Julian was talking about NB fire and this convergence and the movement toward this procurement over the years, then that's the, the really need there in terms of, of uh, having a very safe and secure system. The second point is identifying in writing, identify in writing um, what these agreements are among stakeholders uh, and the HDOs, the manufacturers, and the IT network groups and the people. And then the third is assure the expectation um, among the stakeholders to avert confusion and uninformed decisions. So how many times have you gotten into a situation, you've got the network people, but the manufacturers weren't in line with what you're wanting to do in terms of the agreements before you implement it. And then you had some problems that occur, and then you have to get everybody back together. So this is a way of collaborating right off the bat to make sure uh, you have these responsibility agreements in place. Um, so with that, I'll stop, and I guess, tell you want to have much more interaction and questions here.
responsible for security uh, as opposed to the, the system that that device is attached to? In other words, you have the, the entity that's operating using the device and transmitting the information, and you have a manufacturer that has some embedded software, presumably. To what extent is, is the risk of the vendor extended Yeah, I'll answer as long as it's understood this is protected by attorney-client privilege. So, <laughs> uh, and I do, uh, I mentioned I work with salespeople, engineers. I also work a lot with lawyers, so uh, I always like to rely on that. Uh, I think it's important to consider the environment that a device is going to be used in. I think your point's very good. You, you cannot just look at the device itself. Uh, you know, one, one document that some of you may be familiar with there's a standard disclosure statement called MDS squared. It's a double acronym. It stands for medic, uh, I'm sorry, Medical uh, Manufacturer's Disclosure Statement on Medical Device Security. It's hard to, hard to say that. So MDS squared. Uh, the current version of it has 29 security-related questions. Uh, they're specific to the device's capabilities to provide security and protect information. There's a new version of it. It's probably going to come out next year. It's going to probably have about three times as many questions, but it's very focused on the device. As we're uh, fashioning the new version of that disclosure statement, we want to make sure that every question is very specific to what is observable or inherent within the device itself. Now, the environment it's going to be used in is, is very, very important. So I think when we talk about standards, and I'll use the term standards kind of loosely, let's say practices, uh, when you look at practices, uh, if standards are going to apply to the device, those have to assume a certain uh, a set of standards or practices within the environment that they're going to be used in. Uh, and I'll tell a, a brief story that I, I think helps illustrate this. Uh, first exposure to a high level of security was when I worked for Texas Instruments. I used, I used to work for TI in their defense business when they had one. And I worked on products that I can't tell you what they were, and that's why my, uh, you know, my resume is very thin because much of what I did with, is clouded in secrecy and I can't really talk about it. But uh, I worked in an area that was locked up. Uh, it was just cubicles inside of the area, but you had to have a certain access code to get in there. If you didn't have clearance to be in there, you couldn't go in there. If the copy machine broke down, when we let in the repairman, he had to be literally blindfolded. So we'd blindfold this guy. We'd turn on a siren. It said there's uncleared in the area. Somebody would walk him back to the copy machine take off his blindfold, let him fix the copy machine, and then when he was finished, they'd blindfold him, walk him back out. When I went to uh, like visit my grandma in the hospital, you just walk in and you can wander all over, and I know I'm exaggerating a little bit, it depends on the hospital, but you can kind of wander around, there's a lady with a drug cart, and uh, you can just wander around sort of freely, and that always was such a contrast for me, uh, having been in a very secure environment versus a relatively open environment, and when you're designing the device to protect information and provide security, what are you assuming about the environment it's going to be used in? So I think we have to talk about that as well. So, you know, when I started to interact with Julian and his program, and I thought that medical device security in a certain IT sense was a really interesting public health problem. And, you know, medicine, you never want to be interested in patients. 
right. And that is true for public health problems. And we define a public health problem by three parameters. Uh, how large is the exposure? How potentially uh, bad is the uh, exposure impact? And how preventable is it? So that's the very center of disease control um, sort of approach, which is where I was trained in my work. So uh, the beautiful thing about this uh, from a public health problem perspective is it scores high in all three of those. I'm saying it's great that we have big exposure, it's a big problem, but it's, it's preventable. So CCs is over a billion patient encounters per year. And now you multiply that by the number of times a patient touches the digitally enabled network medical device. And that's uh, multiple billions of exposure. And then in terms of adverse impact, we don't have to think very hard on how CC is going to function correctly. The adverse impact will be very substantial. And uh, on the other hand, if we work together, we can really engineer, not just at the manufacturing you know, point, but uh, industrial engineering or educational engineering, we can really decrease the risk. But you know, while it's a juicy problem, um, you know, what Julian is working on, which is so tightly related, um, is equally, or, or it's actually in some ways more potent, and he's, he's touched on it a little bit. But this notion that medical devices, and, and there's millions of them in this country that are on this natural, you know, natural biomedical device network, and they're not really, uh, from a digital perspective, uh, they're not really tight. Do you, you want to talk a, a little bit about this? And, uh, and sure. Yeah, and I, <clears throat> I think a few a few thoughts uh, uh, you know I can reflect on in the conversation. One of them is around you know kind of bringing this back to procurement and therefore what could the market do? In the end, that's what procurement is about. Um, we we really can't address the whole domain of security or or of our needs uh, through any one pathway. But I think what we're talking about here is is providing capabilities through the procurement pathway. And I, and I want to get back to the, if I could for a moment, the question about who's responsible, the responsibility question. Uh, I, I don't think, you know, sure, th there are a lot of important questions, responsibility and how do we make the whole system secure and should we blindfold people when they walk into the hospital. And I'm kind of interested in giving that a try. When you come visit Mass General, I may, I may blindfold you uh, just for that, spin you around 14 times and ask you to pin the hypodermic on the donkey. Um, I'll, I'll donkey. So, uh, we, you know, there's all these other vulnerabilities, but I think that the focus in the, in the next, you know, kind of phases, certainly with interoperability and I think also with security, is that we want to make sure that you know what you're getting and you know how to configure it and that the capabilities are present in the product. I think it's as simple as that. You know, you buy something, uh, you, you buy a network printer, you, you buy a security appliance, you buy whatever you're buying, you should be able to understand the manual, it should support the, the requirements for your needs. When you configure it, it should be appropriate and it should support what you need. A few years ago, we couldn't buy medical devices that supported our security requirements and we had to make a decision from a wireless, on a wireless device, is it, is it, how important is it? What's the risk and what's the benefit? And most of the time, we simply wouldn't allow its use within the hospital because of the potential security uh, vulnerabilities that are introduced. And now those products are becoming available. The, so now to kind of connect the interoperability aspect to the security aspect, first of all, one begets the other. So if we have devices that continue to be non-networked, uh, to work in, in complete isolation, a standalone medical, you know, blood pressure monitor or a standalone physiological monitor or EEG monitor that has no ports, uh, no connectivity whatsoever to the outside world, uh, it could be compromised, but the risk is probably fairly low. Uh, uh, of course, when you have non-blindfolded people, they could go around and they could, they could introduce uh, uh, malware into a device uh, or it could happen at the, at the source of manufacturing but things are unlikely to change. So as we look at healthcare and decide that there are benefits to device integration, to interoperability, connectivity, there's, there's value to, to networking devices either to push data to the EHR or uh, to facilitate monitoring of device status for biomedical device management or to build smarter and more capable networks with safety interlocks and, and all, all sorts of other benefits or to push device settings down to devices at the point of care. You know, all of these other things that we start to introduce through the, connect, through the connections and through the networking, we now start to um, introduce the security, additional security vulnerabilities. But also as part of interoperability, meaning 
interoperability comes along, the you know, same conversation includes standardization of the interfaces, well documentation of interfaces, not necessarily perfection, uh, but a movement in that direction. It also means that we can better monitor the state of connectivity and the communication. So we could have data logging and black box recorders just as we have in other environments, and just as we have with IT systems, and one can monitor network traffic and understand when behavior changes and becomes problematic, we can expect that that's also part of the evolving ecosystem of interoperability, that we'll be able to look at uh, the behavior of the system, we'll be able to monitor it in ways that we couldn't before, look for, uh, for abnormal behaviors that could be due to device failures and problems, configuration issues, or they could be due to security vulnerabilities or malware. And so these are part and parcel, hand and glove, uh, interoperability, system integration, and, and uh, therefore security. Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah, just one, one thing that occurs to me is that maybe we could shift away from thinking about in terms of devices. Uh, this is a cognitive commodity. It comes on the market, maintained, dies. So if you look at some of the principles of the devices in any of these areas, what are the commonalities in biological systems, machine to machine, sensors, representation, control structures, distributed storage, and effectors? So if we look at the convergence of these biological intelligence systems and our machine intelligence as we move it forward, then it's not a matter of chasing the iPod or the iPhone. It's a matter of understanding those principles and adapting them in a context-aware uh, way. So that's one thing I just want to add to that comment because I think it was a very good question. The other what, the reason I got out of the microphone a few minutes ago is that on the legality of one particular device, particularly, you know, what Jillian was addressing, the convergence with MD Fire and some of the other aspects is that when one device goes down, you have them all working in behavior, um, where's the liability? So the liability is that in the context of the interoperability of numerous devices to perform one task, and what happens when you move to these uh, agreements of manufacturer networking in that legal context. I don't know if you had a comment about that, but I'll, I'll stop there. Your very carefully. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Julian's last comment for the group, so, I think. Well, yeah, I was going to speak to that question about the hearing aids because I've been trying to understand some of the concern. I think your, your, your preface was that would these requirements and would these needs be too heavy-handed to interfere with low-cost innovation? I think that was the essence of how you started. And I didn't see a connection there. Uh, I mean, you could buy a USB memory stick for $10, which has no security protection, and you can spend a little bit more and buy one that has uh, is security, is enabled, and whatever it means. Uh, so I, I don't see that fundamentally that's been an issue, and I'm not quite sure. So let me ask you, the hearing aid in question, does it have any network connectivity? Is not today. Well, so it, so today, at least from the, our perspective in this conversation, it, it seems to be that that's irrelevant unless, and in the future, if there is network connectivity, which might be for status or monitoring or programming or something of the sort, um, and if it's enabled through perhaps, I guess Bluetooth will be too high power consumption, so maybe you'd use that or Zigbee. Um, if that opens up a vulnerability into the network, which Bluetooth does do on computers today, and it's a problem, then there's a valid security concern. And I can't imagine why you, anyone would consider that an inhibition to innovation. And I don't see why anything that we're talking about, if anything, it would allow and facilitate uptake, which would promote innovation by allowing a market to flourish. So I, I don't see that, I don't think it's a valid argument in general that being thoughtful about this, a system and its protection um, and the realities of, of healthcare delivery um, means that we have uh, excessively onerous, you know, we have onerous requirements. Uh, not that, that doesn't go hand in hand. One can make it that way if one wishes, but, but I certainly hope it doesn't. Yeah, building cars safer did not actually drastically increase the cost of cars over time. We just decided, hey, we had to do it. And we're really a lot better off for it today. Nobody looks at a car today and say, God, this would be a lot cheaper if we took off these damn seat belts and got rid of all these, you know, side impact protections. You know, wouldn't even think that. And that's the way you need to look at medical devices going forward. You have to need to equate it with safety requirements. Thank you, Dale, for inviting us.